worship together. This drives the road.
There's just some, something we need to respond this morning with, and, and, uh, and I think it has to do with us letting out some praise and some thanksgiving to the Lord, because He is great, He is good, He's never going to let us down. And so we're going to continue with, great are you, Lord, and we're just going to give an exaltation to God, give an exaltation to your King, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, because He is good to you, and He does love you, and He is great. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord.
think you think there was some breakthrough there. If you feel like you need to shout at any point, you're allowed to shout. If you feel like you didn't capture it in that moment, you can capture it any moment in this place this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you that you are great. Thank you, God, that our bones come alive in you, Father. You are good and you give life. Jesus, the name above all names. God, you're never going to let us down. Great are you, Lord. Some of the lyrics that came out from the worship this morning. Just anointed. Yeah, God, we thank you that God, we can trust in your name. God, that we can build our life upon your name. God, that we can know that in your name all things must bow. All things must come to stand. Father, all things come alive in your name. God, in the simple name of Jesus, everything must come to alignment. God, demons flee at the name of Jesus. Demons will flee at the name of Jesus. Sickness flees at the name of Jesus. Authorities and speakers can bow down to the name of Jesus because you are the name above all other names. So we praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We lift your name in this house today, Jesus. You're worthy of our praise, God. Thank you. Feel like you can just kind of, you can really just preach on some of the stuff that, that comes out in these lyrics. I feel like it's really good for us to to capture that in these moments of worship. You know, this, these teams that are up here, they they take time and they pray about what 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 worship songs are going to be played this morning for this time. And uh, and I think it's very relevant that there's some beautiful lyrics upon those worship songs that uh, that just speak to us in the moments that we're in. So we welcome you this morning. Do I even need to talk about it? It's here. We are cold. And uh, I'm amazed to see everybody here this morning. It's so cool. So awesome. Thank you for braving the cold. Um, for those that are online, I'm sure that you're, you're going online this morning. You may not be able to see us, but you can certainly hear us. And that's, that's 50% there. So um, maybe even more. Maybe we're not meant to see each other this morning only in person. But yes, thank you for coming. Thank you for bearing the cold. Um, you probably will have a little gold star in heaven for this this morning, so <laughs> you can know that. <laughs> it's waiting for you in heaven. And uh, yeah, so awesome. I, I was kind of, I'm going to be totally transparent with you this morning. I, uh, yeah, my attitude wasn't, wasn't great. I wasn't really geared up to come. And uh, maybe I'm the only one, maybe I'm not. But, uh, you know, our car was <laughs> not really doing well. And, you know, we have a, a stick shift, so the, the clutch is just, like, pressing it in just as much as we could. And there was some kind of whistle that kept coming in. And I was like, like, if this breaks, then we cannot break down right now. Why are we driving? The, the, like, the windshield is frosting up over. Like, just, why are we here? And, uh, and then I got in this morning, and, you know, we were praying, and, and, uh, and I just felt the Holy Spirit just kind of convict my heart and say, you know, this is a place of refuge, and this is a place where God dwells. And if it's for one person that felt like they needed to come this morning for something, then that's worth everything. And Jesus said if it's the one lost sheep that he would go after them. So I just really felt convicted that, you know, it's... It, church doesn't just happen with one person. Church takes a village, and it takes people to come in and to set up and to worship and to and to and to bring in the chairs and to do all of the the kids connection and everything is a part of the service that we have here. And if it wasn't for us coming here, um, then then it wouldn't be happening, and we, there wouldn't be a place of refuge. Whether it's minus fifty or plus thirty, there's always a place of refuge here, and you can count on this place being open. 
And so I just, I really felt convicted in my heart this morning for that. And, and we just, I thank you guys for, for being here and for, for coming and for making this place a safe place to come. Because you never know who's going to come through those doors needing a refuge and needing the name of Jesus. And so within that, I'm just going to read a scripture and then I'm going to go into announcements. But it's uh, Genesis 28. Uh, 18 it says the next morning Jacob got up very early and he took the stone so we're talking about Jacob after he had his dream and he was laying on a stone and the stone and he saw the angels ascending and descending from heaven and uh, the next morning Jacob got up very early and he took the stone that he had rested on his head against it and he set it upright as a memorial pillar then he poured out olive oil all over it and he named that place Bethel which means house of God although it was previously called Luz. Then Jacob made this vow, if God will indeed be with me and protect me all of this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will, be, will become a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God, to God a tenth of everything that he gives me. So obviously I'll come back to that with our time, but I just felt like that was kind of a scripture that, that just represented the house of God, the, the pillar, the, the one that, that Jacob saw angels ascending and descending from heaven. And he took that, he took that rock and he anointed it and, and, he, and he called it Bethel, which is house of God. And I just really felt like that was kind of stirring in my heart for, for this morning, that, that this is a house of God. This is a place of refuge. This is a place where where we can see angels ascending and descending. And certainly I think we have seen that in our worship services. And so, yeah, we just we thank God for that. And, and thank you for, for coming this morning and for, for continuing to come uh, to this family. You're welcome here. You're a part of our family. If you're if you're new this morning, and uh, or if, if this is your second or third visit, so good to see you. And uh, you're, you're a family here when you first walk in those doors. And so please get connected. Please don't feel... Um, shy to just just connect with anybody that you see that uh that someone knows somebody that can connect you with with uh, with a life group or, or mentoring or we, we want to be more than just a sunday service so so we welcome you here um if you feel like there's a prophetic word or a testimony that you have stirring in your hearts this morning please feel free to come up and, and we can share that um yeah just just so good to to be here this morning yeah yeah, come on up. Now's the time. It's great to see the kids. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I was, we're just singing and praising the Lord, and I feel like I should share with this with you. <laughs> Our baby was born December 19th. Amen. And thank you. <laughs> Thankfully, everything went very well. Yeah. I'm healthy uh, because I was considered a high risk pregnancy. I had a history of retention, placenta retention, and we had to go to the hospital. And everything was ready for bleeding and blood transfusion if necessary because I had this history and everything went so well. <laughs> and thank you Camille for your prayers. No bleeding, no pleasant retention, everything was alright. Uh, I was very worried about the day of delivery. Uh, the pain is a lot <laughs> and I was very anxious about it and when we got in the hospital I was Feeling the pain of active labor, like the baby's going to come at any time, and the doctor told me I was only three centimeters, and I said, Oh no, this is not right. I can't stand this. And I got this great. My blood drive pressure went down, and I was like, I can't do this. And then the Lord was taking care of me. He will never let me down. That's right. That's right. And then a little more than one hour later, the baby was born. <laughs> so, yes, you, he's not going to let you That's down. Right. That's right. Amen. Let's just thank you, God, we just thank you, Father. We just pray right now, God, that all pain be removed right now. 
Jesus' name. We pray everything that's postpartum, post-pregnancy, God, would just be restored, uh, that she would be healthy and just back to, to being a mother that's full of health. We just thank you for this beautiful testimony, this beautiful baby that comes out of, out of your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. ascending and descending <laughs> at church and at home. That's awesome. I encourage you to worship with your kids. It's such an amazing time. Cool. That's good testimonies on a cold day like today. That'll warm up us all. Cool. Well, let's jump into announcements. We have one announcement. Um, so we mentioned last week the Ronald McDonald House. Uh, so we are geared up for February 10th and there are a few spots available. So if you feel like you want to register, um, on the app, on the website, or just email the office. Would that be right? Okay. So probably just email the office would be good to say I want to sign up for the Ronald McDonald House. And um, uh, that is a, uh, if you don't know Ronald McDonald House, I'm sure you know of it, but uh, basically a time where I think we can get together and just help to provide um, some food and a meal. Yeah, a meal. meal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't know as much as I should about that. But it's a time to just minister, so if you feel like called to that, then. Then do that. So, yeah, um, yeah. I think that's. I think that's it. I just wanted to kind of give a quick plug for uh, life groups and mentoring. And um, yeah, if you're so life groups happen once a week, and we visit our, our houses. We usually have the slides going up after church. So if you're unaware of life groups, it's a time where we come together and where we meet. Uh, in our homes, we sh often share a meal and just share with one another, um, and where it's kind of the, the bloodline of, of, of church. So we come and meet and we get equipped here, but the life groups are really where, where the meat and bones are at in, in church. And so if you have a, an inkling or a stirring that you really want to get connected, um, you don't have to commit to every week, just please commit to something and just come and just join in on a meal. Um, me and Cammie have been leading a life group since we've been married for 10 years, and I tell you, there has been so much beautiful ministry that have come out of these these places and these times and and um, and we're so grateful for for being and having that so if you feel like you want to just um, uh, email the office and, and get set up for that as well as men's mentoring and women's mentoring all of that is on our website all that's on our app great to get connected this is if this is all we're coming to on a sunday it's not enough we need to get connected we need to we need to do life together live life together and share with one another so just felt like maybe there was uh, some, someone that needed to hear that this morning. So let's jump into our tithe, and then we will release the kids and bring up our guest speaker this morning. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate Genesis 20, uh, 28, 18. So I think, I believe this is the second actual tithe within the scriptures. The first one was with Abraham, and uh, where he gave a tenth to Mel Melchizedek, I think is his name. Um, but this is the second uh, kind of... Uh, performance of tithe within within the uh, the Old Testament, and so I'll just read it again because it kind of it goes along with the with the place of refuge and and into and into tithing. And so it, it says, the next morning Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he had rested his head against and he set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. He named that place Bethel, which means house of God. Then Jacob made this vow. If God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, hear those, hear those words. If God will protect me along this journey that I am on, and if, if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything that He gives me. Amazing! I think that's one of my favorite scriptures. It just it just kind of sums everything up in in in, in 
what we do as a church. That, you know, we have testimonies of God being with us, God being for us. God is, God is here. He, is, he will never let us down. He will always give us clothing. He will always protect us. And if that be the case, and it's not a, bar, it's not a, a thing of bar, bargaining with God. It's not that we give so that He will give. It's that He's already given. He's already loved us so we can love Him. He's already given us these things. So if that be the case, then certainly I should give a tenth or I should give generously to God in the house of God, in the place of worship, the place that we come to worship God. And so in the midst of that, let's take up our tithes and offerings. As you know, there's many places to give. Um, finances at life, finance at lifeconnection.ca on the app, on the website. And then our lovely basket over there for the gold and, and myrrh and things. Um, Father, we thank you so much that this is a place that we can call the Bethel, that we can call the house of God, God, that we can we can come and we can worship you. We can lift you up. We can anoint you, God. This is an anointed place, Father, that we can see angels ascending and descending from heaven, God. And, and uh, God, we praise you. We thank you for the testimonies that were shared this morning and all throughout Life Connection, the, the history of testimonies that are in this place. Surely you are here. Surely you are God. And surely you will be with us forever and ever in eternity. And so therefore, we will give to you what is owed to you, Father, and what, what you deserve, and you deserve so much more. So we thank you for your son, Jesus, that died on the cross, that gave the full sacrifice so that we can be set free. In Jesus' name, amen. Release the kids. We'll be going outside this morning, so just grab your tubes and your, and your coats and bundle them up. So you have a nice day in the park. Um, yeah, come on up, Sue. So I'm privileged of, of bringing up Sue this morning, and she's going to share. Um, I'm sad I'll be missing it in person, but I don't have to. Oh, I'm going to be able to get it online. I'll hear it. I'll hear it. We're going to put it up. Yep. It'll be up online. Awesome. Okay, I need that. Uh, oh, I need a microphone. Oh, you need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Just yell soon. <laughs> Test. Yell. Wow, what a privilege it is to be here this morning. It really, truly, truly is. And what an exhilarating feeling of getting outside this morning. In Cochrane, it was minus 34. Here in the parking lot this morning, it was minus 38. So, well done. <laughs> Well done for being here, you hearty Albertans, and those that have immigrated to Alberta. Very proud of you. Wow, well, if, I, if I start leaking in my eyes this morning, it's because I am very passionate about what I'm going to be uh, sharing with you. And I just, I just pray that Holy Spirit will release something that you'll have ears to hear, eyes to see something. Maybe not everything that I speak about, but, but there's something that will, hopefully, you can glean from. Um, so thank you, Heavenly Father, for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be here together, worshiping together. What an awesome privilege. So I do like to tell stories, and I will tell some stories. And I love illustrations, and I love the word. So you're going to get a mixture of a bunch of things yeah. this morning. But I'm going to start out with this. And I have to take my glasses off so I can see you better. Who likes to do puzzles? Yeah. Oh, you got a few hands. Not many. <laughs> Some of us love them. Some of us not so much. I am a puzzler, but only um, in season. And now is the season. It's always in the new year. I ask for a puzzle at Christmas time, and it's my challenge to complete the picture within usually a month. But then one year, my kids decided they were going to see if they could do a mummy in. And they bought me a 4,000 piece puzzle. But no, I have German determination, and I did finish it, and I was very proud of myself. Um, and usually there's a few groans in the house when, you know, after Christmas, because I always take it out after Christmas, because I spread everything out on the dining room table. It's like, oh, there's the puzzle again. But I did get a puzzle mat for Christmas this year. Nice. I haven't really used it. But yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's no fun to put puzzles away anyways. So I always start with the edges. And then, because that's the easiest, 
And then I choose either a color or an object um, to concentrate on. And when I get frustrated, which I always will, I will move to another spot. Or even, last week, I went across the table and worked backwards um, to get a different perspective. Some days it's maybe only one piece, depending on how much time I have, and other times it's 30, and that would be a fantastic day. And then there's always the daily statement. It was in front of my face the entire time. Or, I tried that piece. How many times? Why does it fit now? And sometimes, it only fits when another piece is put in. Now, that's a life lesson right there. And I'll let you think about that one. In the end, there is great satisfaction. And then the puzzle goes back in the box. So I will summarize a little bit of what Derek said last week because he already started the outline of the puzzle. Before I do that, I just, I forgot a statement and I wanted to say it. So life can be like a puzzle sometimes, right? Or just puzzling. Yeah, I had to fit that in. <laughs> So what Derek was talking about is very, very important. And if you have, didn't listen to his message, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. He says that, he said this, God sees the whole finished picture. He sees the finished puzzle. And we are to seek his perspective, recognize our contribution, and advance with him. Derek referenced 2 Timothy. And he said a few things from 2 Timothy. One is the word. Be prepared in season and out of season to use it. To preach, teach, encourage the word. So, so important. We also need to be persuaded. Standing true. Tough times will come. We need to trust and be fully convinced. Otherwise, we will default to fear. We need to remain faithful. Pursue righteous living. Prepared to do his work. Are we being an influencer or are we being influenced? He talked about word, worship, prayer, intimacy, hearing, and obedience. And obedience is such a key. I am going to be repeating that phrase throughout today's message because that is so important. It's foundation. It is the outline of the picture. It is the starting place. No matter where we find ourselves in life, now these things of word, worship, prayer, intimacy, hearing, and obedience, there is a phrase that is going around in Christian circles, and it's called the rule of life. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but I want to describe that. It comes from sacred ordinary days. You can Google it. There's lots of things on the rule of life. Because sometimes it's just simpler to say rule of life, and then you know what I'm talking about. Word, worship, prayer, intimacy, hearing, obedience, etc. Rule of life is a commitment to live your life in a particular way. It is meant to be crafted with prayer and discernment in partnership with God as you, as you consider the way God made you and the values he has inscribed upon your heart. Once written, it serves as a tool that can help you make decisions for your life and determine how to best order your days. The first example of a Christian rule of life actually came from the Desert Fathers, and I know Graydon has spoken about that in the past. And by the way, he would love to be here. He is one of the ones at the stomach bug today. Um, so it, come, it came from the Desert Fathers, St. Benedict. It was a monastic community of mystics living in Egypt around the third century. And so he wrote this 1,500 years ago, which helped create it was created to help his community of monks translate their faith into habits and rhythms of their shared daily life. Okay? But the goal, the goal of this, because we can get very religious, and, and, and the goal is not to be religious and just to follow rules. Or a knowledge gatherer, that's not the goal. The goal is to have intimacy with Jesus. And this is essential for being an influencer. And that's the foundation of what I'm going to speak on today. And that is missional living. 
Missional living is one of the values that you will see uh, posted on Life Connections value site and their website and also in Church of the Nations. And this groups together actually three values, and I'm just going to read them, if that's okay. God's kingdom is built on righteousness and justice. We build upon this foundation to bring lasting kingdom influence to our world. We are passionate about seeing the local church bring God's kingdom to our city, our nation, and our world. We pursue God's vision and compassion for the world and co-labor with him to share his love for the lost. You know that in 1 Timothy, you've heard this before, 1 Timothy 2.4, that God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge and recognition of divine truth. I want to share an observation and a word of encouragement before I go on. This value was and is extremely important to both Pete and Tess. I know that because I've known them for a couple decades. And within the last years, a couple years, I have witnessed, especially the last year, I have witnessed so many of you living this out. Well done. Well done. You're not just living it here for a Sunday and being committed, but I'm seeing it in everyday life. So let's define what missional living is a little bit more, just so we have a clear picture. So I'm going to use a great definition found from Wikipedia. It's okay. I've already passed this through my husband, who is the Bible scholar, and it actually summarizes it very well in lay terms. I'm not a Bible school professor, uh, nor have I gone to Bible school, but I do love the Word, and I do have a husband that helps me out with things like this. So this is what Wikipedia says. Missional living is a Christian practice to adopt the thinking, behaviors, and practices of a missionary in everyday life in order to engage others with the gospel message. Now, traditionally, Christians have seen mission as either a special event or going off to Africa, you know, for a full-time job for a few individuals or being a full-time pastor. But really what missional living is, is it's seen, it is seen as a way of life for all Christians at all times. All Christians should be involved in the Great Commission. And maybe you're not familiar with what the Great Commission is, so I'll just give you a little summary from Matthew 28, 16 to 20. In verse 18 it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end. So this might seem a little daunting, because it's like, how on earth can I do that? But I want to emphasize what Jesus said at the end. He said, I am with you. You are not alone. You are not alone. And I will be repeating that a few times today. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus describes the church as an ecclesia. And that's a Greek word meaning an assembly or a group of people called together for a purpose. So guess what? We're not alone. We are all the ecclesia. We are a group of people called together for a purpose. We are the called out ones. We are also God's priceless children, sons and daughters of the Most High. And that title never leaves us. We don't walk out of here on Sunday morning and we leave our identity here. That is with us at all times. Whether we believe it or not, we represent something and someone at all times. And that can lead us to another description of who we are, and that is ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21 says this, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak 
for Christ, with, we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And it is through Christ and what he did for us on the cross that makes us in right standing. That's where our righteousness is, not in what we do ourselves. It is through Christ. So what is an ambassador? If you look up in the dictionary, Britannica says it's the highest ranking person who represents his or his own government while living in another country. Cambridge will say it's a person who represents, speaks, or advertises a, or a particular organization, group of people, activity, or brand. So we are representatives, okay? So summarize what I said, and we're gonna get to some of the fun stuff. We are ambassadors of King Jesus and his kingdom. We are the ecclesia, called at once, called together for a purpose. And when we partner with Holy Spirit, when we are intimate through the word, worship, prayer, and obedience, we will be living missional lives. We will be influencers. If you want another term that you want to grab onto, we will be atmosphere changers, or we will be change agents in our workplace and in our daily lives. No matter if we're at home, in the grocery store, or at work, or anywhere. And it is not dependent on where we think we should be or what we want to do. This is who we are at all times, right? right. But, you know, this can be a, like a, a good feel kind of thing is that, okay, I'm gonna be a, mission, a missional. I'm gonna be an ambassador. And it's good. And we need to have those foundations of what I said before, what is that? Word, worship, prayer, yeah. obedience, right? And it's easy, or easier, I should say, to be missional when we enjoy the environment, we're, the environment that we are in. <laughs> or we know that we're, we're actually doing something, right? It, it is much easier. It's easier to, when we can see, when we can see something. It's much easier to get up, get into our car, pray on the way to work or school or whatever, when we, and then it's even easier to have our eyes and our ears open to okay, okay, what the next Holy Spirit. Uh, to, to grab those opportunities to pray for people, send co-worker scriptures. And this is absolutely fantastic, and it can be a lot of fun too. And I've had a lot of fun doing this over the years. I really have, truly, truly have. Uh, I've been privileged to be a nurse for many decades and also a missionary in Africa and a mom and a neighbor. And I've learned over the years that this can be so much fun. So I encourage you, this can be fun. Listening to Holy Spirit. And if something comes into, and I'm intimate with him, I say, oh, he says, okay, go give a Bible to that person. Oh, really? Are you kidding me? Like, I don't even know them. I don't know where they're at. But in those obedience, oh my goodness, have doors opened up. I could tell you stories upon stories upon stories, but I don't have the time to do that this morning. One thing I can say, though, is being intentional with building relationships, or even just offering a kind word, allows future opportunities to talk about Jesus or to pray. I'm going to get a little bit more into praying uh, later because that's so important. Now, this didn't always come easy for me. Um, I actually only started recognizing that this was such an important thing many years ago when I was a nurse. Actually, I was just a brand new nurse. And I started working in um, uh, just a surgical unit and was very shy, wasn't really confident. But I did love Jesus. I was in the Word, and I did pray. Uh, I came across a nurse that um, her name, and I can tell you her name, um, Allison. She was from the UK. She had immigrated here, didn't know anyone. She just wanted to escape her family and whatever else she was writing from. And she seemed really kind of harsh and rash. It's like, ooh, I don't know if I like her. In fact, I actually honestly thought that maybe she was into some very dark things like witchcraft. And I just, in my mind, my natural state was like, oh, I'm just going to kind of stay away from her because I, I don't know, I don't know about this lady. 
Anyways, Holy Spirit convicted me, and I realized that this lady was lonely. She didn't have family. And to make a long story short, I, in obedience, I invited her to family Christmas dinner. I didn't think she would come, but she did. And whoa, boy, did that start a process of slow relationship, but a relationship where, and I'm going to kind of fast forward, um, where every once in a while we parted ways in, in the work environment. So it was only connecting through phone, no cell phones those days to text. Every once in a while a phone call and every once in a while meeting her. But I really felt at one point Holy, Holy Spirit said, you need to get a hold of her. I called, couldn't. But I knew where she lived. And in obedience, I went to her house. I basically broke into her house. Got past her huge German shepherd, which I didn't know. <laughs> and found an emaciated, about an 80-pound lady that was on the brink of death from alcoholism. Somehow got her into my car with her dog. It's the only way she could get in my car. Got her to emergency. They didn't have a place in the detox center, but the, I get a long story short, she ended up going through rehab. And that was my part. Yeah. In the end, Allison found Jesus. Found Jesus in a big way. And her life didn't get much easier. She, she had actually lost her job through, um, was fired because she was an alcoholic. Never went back to nursing. She actually ended up getting MS. And, uh, but she loved Jesus. And uh, God told her to move back to the UK, which she did. And she reconciled with her family. And uh, I had then, and then she was like always praying for Grady and I. She knew when we went to Africa, she said, I'm praying for you. She would write letters. And when I moved this year, I found all these letters from her. It was so amazing. <laughs> Anyways, I was going to go and visit her in the UK, and I planned to surprise her. And uh, then I got a phone call from her mom, and she had passed away. But I went anyways, because I had a plane ticket. <laughs> and it was so beautiful to see, because her family was describing this amazing lady that just shined Jesus. And just was this bright light. And the reason I tell you this is because I, I just played a small part in that. And it was from obedience. It wasn't uncomfortable. Yes, it was. But it's just how God works through ways that we don't see. And I don't know who else influenced her life, but I just wanted to share that with you because that set me an emotion up, or in the track of my career and my life that whether I'm smiling at someone or giving an encouraging word or praying that it does make a difference. And that really is what I'm getting at today. Word, worship, prayer, intimacy, hearing and being obedient for the will of life. But I also felt that I needed to touch on something else this morning. You know, sometimes it's more than just being pushed out of our comfort zone for a few minutes. What if we can't really see around the corner or the next mountain or the mountain range? Perhaps you're in a situation or an environment that is far from ideal and you to feel like you're an ambassador or you don't want to be missional. Life has maybe thrown you curveball a wrench or maybe you don't even have a choice of where you are in life and it's not in alignment with your desires or goals, dreams or even your education. Or maybe you've lost something or someone. Grief is real. Loss is real. So how do we be missional when we're disappointed, sad, lonely, unsure, in conflict, or even in business uh, partners that our values are really different? Well, we need to remember something, that we are still ambassadors, that we're still change agents, we're still atmosphere changes. And some of the most powerful moments of being ambassador is actually in how you're handling a not great situ situation. Eyes are always on us. We're not perfect. Life is messy. So when we mess up, what do we do? Well, we be accountable, we be honest, we be vulnerable, and we remember that we are not alone.
Have you ever been in a situation where you said, oh, I'd rather have a filling than be do this? <laughs> I'm guilty. <laughs> So another story of mine is that I was still out, it's resolving, been involved in a, in a business for years, over a decade, that there was very much conflicting values and goals with fear and control mixed in it. Very, very hard. It took a lot out of me, it took a lot out of my family. But you know what? We, I had not have a choice, but I had to stand for righteousness fought for it, even considered getting legal action. That was even a year ago. And then it's just like, God, 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 I, trust, I have to trust you. I don't see, I don't understand. And in the end, it's amazing what God does behind the scenes. It really is. Change happened. Relationships became closer. They're not exactly where I want them to be, but these business relationships are closer. So be that ambassador for kingdom righteousness. Keep praying for wisdom and right steps to take. Be the change agent, even though it's not uncomfortable. That is, even when it's not comfortable, give it to God and trust Him. Romans 8, again, we're not alone. And I would encourage you to read Romans 8. There's so much good in that. You know that Jesus and Holy Spirit are working, praying, and orchestrating things we just can't see or know about. Remember, He wants all men and women and children to be saved. He is working out everything for our good and the good of others. The Spirit is pleading for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Even when we don't see it, He is and the key is so that we don't see everything or know everything. And I think that's for, on purpose. So in 1 Corinthians 13, that's the love chapter. You can read that too. It says that we only know in part. Yeah. We only see in part. For now in this time of imperfection, we see in a mirror dimly a blurred reflection, a riddle and enigma. But then, when the time of perfection comes, we will see reality. So that will be an eternity, face to face. Now I know in part, just in fragments, like that puzzle. But then I will know fully, just as I've been fully known by God. Okay? And this is the kindness of God, that we don't see everything and know everything. Otherwise, we wouldn't need them. So this missional life is based on trusting him. Full stop. And the why is, why did this happen? Why is this happening? It may never be known on this side of heaven. However, God knows and he sees the completed picture. And we rest in this truth. We cannot do this alone. And we, it's not just us with wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, is with each other. We will collectively do this life together, and we collectively will point others to Jesus. There's a missionary by the name of Dr. Helen Rosevere. She was a, a medical uh, missionary doctor in Congo. Did work there for many, many, many years. You can look her up on YouTube. It's actually a fantastic testimony. And at one point, rebel, rebels came in, and they we're going to kill all the Christians and especially the white people. And they came to beat her and they raped her and they were had a gun to her head and one of the rebels actually came and said, whoa, this doctor saved me. I think he had gunshots or whatever and he had, she had treated him. And he said, she's a good woman, do not hurt her. And in all this processing, Dr. Helen came to this conclusion. And this is something that I've used over the last year, because it's helped me when I, especially when I don't see and don't know why, I say, God, thank you for trusting me in this situation, even when I don't understand why it happened. You know, I've had many amazing opportunities at work, and uh, Edmonton was just uh, working at the cross cancer there. It was just, it, yes, it's hard. It's not a, an easy area to work, but the opportunities that God gave me, 
were amazing, and I love my coworkers, still love them. Then I came to Calgary, and I'm, I'm working casual at the Tom Baker, and in my first week at the Tom Baker, some things were like, oh no, I can't believe this happened. So my first week, I got a needle stick injury. And, and part of it was my fault. Part of it actually was um, just the way they had their things set up. I was like, oh God. But you know what, even in that circumstance, with what happened in reporting and standing up for right things, they changed things. So it's safer. Safer for my other coworkers. Safer for other people. So again, it's just an example of, wow, you find yourself in situations, you think this is awful. But God can still use it. He can still use you. But again, you might be thinking, oh, but how can I do this? Life is great, but now it's not so great. This past summer, I went floating down the river here in the, in the boat. And I did it the summer before, and I just loved it. And I thought, okay, this is great. I love water. I love to float. So we had a this forecast was like, eh, a little sketchy for maybe some thunderstorms. So we're about halfway, and uh, all of a sudden the wind picked up. And I'm by myself in a blow-up kayak. Two-person blow-up kayak. So now, I, and I don't weigh a whole lot, and so now <laughs> I can't control this thing at all. And I'm getting a little fearful because I can see the clouds coming. I can see the the thunder rolling in the, the west. And my family, they're just going on down the river. Like, so what do I do? I get off the river oh, by myself. Wasn't the wisest thing, but at the moment I thought, I can't do this. I can't do this. In the end it worked out. Okay. But I, I came to that point where I just can't do this. So maybe you're feeling like, I just can't do this right now. I heard this beautiful illustration, and I just I want to paint a picture here of, um, of the Dead Sea. Has anybody been to Israel? Anybody floated in the Dead Sea? Okay. I think you know what you're gonna, I'm going to be talking about. What feeds the Dead Sea is the Jordan River. And if you're a history buff, look up the Jordan River. River. Lots of life. It's an amazing thing. But it ends in the D Dead Sea. The Dead Sea actually doesn't, water doesn't go out of there because it's in the desert uh, and it's hot and it's dry, it evaporates. So the Dead Sea, nothing grows in it except for a few algae and microorganisms. It's one of the saltiest bodies of water on Earth. It's almost 10 times more salt than ordinary seawater. And there's about 37 billion tons of salt, I'm just reading some facts here. It's also 423 meters below sea level, which makes it the lowest point on Earth before you get into the ground. The Dead Sea has a lot of salt in it. And you know what? I think God has a sense of humor. Because if you've been in the Dead Sea, you know that you really, you float, like you almost feel like you're above the water. You're not going to drown. Well, unless you try it. If you try it, it's hard. I was there as a kid. It's really hard to flip over. You're not going to drown unless you actually drink the water. <laughs> but when we're singing, thank you for singing that song, You're Never Going to Let Me Down. You're Never Going to Let Me Down. And the word, You're Never Going to Let Me Drown. <laughs> you're Never Going to Let Me Drown. You are good, and God is good. Not only do you float in the Dead Sea, your body is being renewed by minerals. It is one of the places has been like before Jesus was even born. It was known for its healing properties. And people still go there for that. So even if you feel like you're in the Dead Sea, I want you to kind of switch your perspective and say, okay, I am not drowning. I'm not going down. This is a place for me to be intimate with my Father, to be renewed, to reach out to other people, 
to be healed. Word, worship, prayer, intimacy, hearing and being obedient to the rule of life. While you're floating, try and gain perspective. There's a song by Leland and Charity Gale, you may have heard it. It says, if you still, if you still have breath in your lungs, you're not done. Yeah. Right? You're not done. So I'm going to tell you another story um, of mission living, of, of what I've had the privilege of, of doing. Again, it's with a coworker in Edmonton, and um, she posts everything online and openly online. As my dear friend Jenny has uh, stage four pancreatic cancer. Uh, that diagnosis came a year ago. And wow, when you work in oncology, and you work with one of the most amazing oncology nurses, and then they come up with this diagnosis that is horrendous. It really hits hard. Backing up a little bit, Jenny and I, we've worked together for, I guess, 10 years. And she was the one, one of the ones that Holy Spirit highlighted and said, you know, get to know her. So I supported one of her businesses outside of work. And we love plants. And we just started to become friends. And um, that has led especially in this last year, two opportunities to bring her more plants, to pray with her. And I just want to read something that I sent to her. And I wasn't going to send it, but again, this was just obedience to what Holy Spirit told me to, to do. I came across this, this book at my mom's that I had given my mom years and years ago. And it's called Choose Joy. You know, Jenny had posted Oh, a few months ago about choosing joy and she does not profess a faith and I actually don't know where she stands quite yet but she has allowed me to pray for her but anyways I sent this to her and I want to read this because I think this may bless if, even if it's one person I just got to read this it's called parallel train tracks I used to think that life came in waves there was a wave of good and pleasant circumstances followed by a wave of bad and unpleasant circumstances, with a lot of ebb and flow in between. Where life was a series of hills and valleys, sometimes we're up and then we're down. But I've come to realize that life is much more like a set of parallel train tracks with joy and sorrow running inseparably throughout our days. Every day of your life, good things happen. Beauty, pleasure, fulfillment, and perhaps even excitement occurs. That's the track of joy. But every day of your life also holds disappointments, challenges, struggles, and perhaps even losses for you or those you love. That is a track of sorrow. Most of us try to outsmart the track, the sorrow track by concentrating our efforts on the joy track. As if by our positive outlook or outright denial of reality, we can make the sorrow track go away. That's impossible, because joy and sorrow will always be linked. And in the strange paradox of the universe, at the exact moment you and I are experiencing pain, we are also aware of the sweetness of loving and the beauty still to be found. Likewise, at the exact moment we are full of delirious delight, we have the nagging realization that things are still not quite perfect. No matter how positive we think or how hard we try to visualize only happiness, the sorrow track remains. One of our toughest challenges in life is to learn how to live on both of these tracks at the same time. But there's hope. Look ahead with me. And then she talks about going with her grandson on the tracks and looking, and in the distance, you can see that both tracks actually go into one track. This comes from Kay Warren's She's Joy book. So I sent this to Jenny. And she actually posted it. So it's all over her, her social media. I thought, wow, I wasn't going to send that to her. But it's just this name, you know, I gotta send it, I gotta send it. So you just never know what you are doing, how it impacts some impacts someone, and then it impacts other people. Yeah. 
So love, love is the thing that motivates us, first and foremost, and we represent Jesus. So what would Jesus do and what would Jesus say? And I want to get back to prayer. I've been fortunate, as I said already before, in my work practice, I've had many opportunities to pray with patients, mostly in the intensive care unit when I worked there because it was private rooms. And now it's mostly with my coworkers. And you know what? I've never had a coworker refuse prayer, ever. No matter what the belief is, I've never had that. And I can't emphasize this enough. You know, James 5, 16 says, the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man or believer, this is from the Amplified, can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. And if you don't know what to pray, pray this simple prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is on heaven. Simple. Simple and powerful. We don't know what is happening in the heavenlies. But I do know this. God is always wanting people to be saved. And he loves every and each one of us so much. And he's always orchestrating things. And we don't see it. When we, we don't see what he's doing, we can. But we don't see everything. And that's humbling. In 1 Corinthians 3, 7, it says it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God is making the seed grow. It has been so encouraging and amazing to find out what God is up to behind the scenes. And I go to more stories, but I don't have time. He is orchestrating. He is continually working. We only see in part, and that's okay. That's okay. But he wants us to partner with him. Let's get back to the puzzle. This is the end of what I'm saying, saying today. The puzzle. It is not complete without getting peace. You are an important part of God's design and kingdom picture, no matter where you are. Whether you're swimming in the Jordan, or floating in the Dead Sea, or on the track of joy or sorrow, if you still have breath in you, you're not done. We don't see the entire picture or puzzle that God does. Will you live a missional life? Will you be part of that active picture? Will you acknowledge that you are not just an ambassador, but a son and daughter of the Most High King? And he loves you dear, dearly, and he loves all of us dearly, and he wants to use us together, no matter where we are in life. Once we have accepted Jesus as our Savior and King, our title never changes. We are his sons and daughters, the Ecclesia and ambassadors. And what is your role in life? So that we together, together can bring lasting kingdom influence to our world. Whether it's for the gospel of salvation or the gospel of the kingdom, even if it's just putting things in right order in a workplace, we are ambassadors of the ecclesia or the called out ones. We pursue God's vision and compassion for the world and co labor with Him and others to share His love with the lost. I'm going to end with this one other picture. I wasn't going to share it, but I need to. If you're into trees or plants, you may have heard of something called the mycorrhizal network. And it's this network of communication that's underneath the soil. And we don't see it, but there's things like birch trees and forests that rely on this for communication and also relies on it to enhance the absorption of nutrients and waters. It helps a, a, a forest flourish. Who of you want to flourish? Yeah. I do, but I can't do it alone. We need Holy Spirit, and we need each other. Do you get the picture? That's right. yeah. 
I actually saw a pic uh, on, I was just Googling it again today, and I saw pictures of um, the root system without this uh, uh, fungal network and, and, and one with it. And the root system is like so much bigger, so much stronger. So we need each other. We need Holy Spirit. And we all can be missional. We're all called to be mission, mission, missionaries, if you want to use that term. And it can be fun. But yeah, there's times where it's a lot. Don't see your issue, but that's okay. <laughs> so Father, thank you that you are so good. Thank you that you are our creator. Thank you that you are our, the orchestrator of good and our futures, and that you want all men to know you. So you, are, you are love, you are light, you are love. Thank you that we have the privilege of connecting with you and with each other. Help us to be mindful of this. And thank you that we don't see everything, that we have to trust you. So I'm going to end here, but I also want to invite you, if you do need prayer, that any of us, we're all missionaries, we all can do that, we can all pray for each other. Amen? Okay, amen, I'm done. <laughs>